All right. Well, uh, in Jesus name, pray that you bless this time now. Uh, I'm really excited, perhaps more excited about this new book than any book I've ever put out. And uh, I'm going to start promoting it July 12th. And it's the purpose, power and process of prophetic ministry. Um, I began This book, The Purpose, Power, and Process of Prophetic Ministry, has been in my heart for three years. Um, I started collecting a bunch of essays I wrote and articles and different things and putting my thoughts together several years back. And I knew I was supposed to release a book. And then uh, in January, on the heels of all the prophetic craziness that went on, which showed showcase the fact that much of the body of Christ doesn't understand how to operate in the prophetic. Um, I felt the Lord compelling me to write the book while I was away in Florida. So in one week, I put the whole thing together, rough draft, of course, had to go through various edits and different things the last five months. Uh, and uh, so the official day of release is, is, is this Monday. Uh, that's when we're going to start promoting it. And uh, I'll ask you all to help me promote it. I'll send you all the link again because of Facebook. I don't have the ability to boost anything. I don't know. I still don't know what's going on. Um, so I'm going to need all my friends to help. And we did a great job promoting the Bridge Summit. We had as many people or more than last year. And we didn't pay any money to promote it. Last year, we paid $2,000. This year, we didn't pay, pay anything, and uh, we had possibly more people. I think we had over a 1,000 people participating in the Bridge Summit, uh, and it was just all of you helping me get the word out. So if we band together, we can overcome this media censorship. Um, so what I wanted to do the next three weeks is highlight a chapter in the book, because truth be told, the book really has an apostolic slant to it, and I don't think there's been a book out on the prophetic like this since Bill Hammond's first few books four decades ago, three or four decades ago. But this is only one book, and uh, it's a compilation of things that will encourage the prophetic, prophetic uh, checks and balances, a critique of what happened in the last election cycle, and um, it will not discourage anybody from operating the prophetic. I just want you to understand that it'll actually encourage them. And this book will be a pastor's best friend. It'll stop all the wildfire. If they take heed, it'll protect the church from all the social media prophets. If they read it, if I were you, I'd order a copy for everybody in your church and make sure they all read it. Eventually we need to get it in Spanish as well. Um, I need someone to help me translate it. And um, uh, I just think this is a really, really important book. That's a balance of prophetic inspiration, but also prophetic protection. Uh, and, um, and Robert Gay is on and he uh, read through the whole book and he's a very powerful prophet and works with CI and he endorsed the book and also Randy Clark, Michael Brown wrote the forward and uh, others uh, that you may know, like uh, Bishop Kyle Searcy um, and several others. I, I don't have the names right off the top of my head, but um, I think it's a really important book. And so what I wanted to do, what I felt the Lord laid on my heart is to share from chapter 15 today, which is something that very few people teach on. Um, very few people are aware of this. It has to do with knowing not just getting a prophetic word, but knowing the ways of God and how he deals with the church, it cycles. There's cyclical ways God deals with his people, as we see in the scriptures. And so in chapter 15, I deal with the process of purging and repentance before prophetic fulfillment. Uh, and so we see a snapshot of this in the original quote unquote Palm Sunday, we see that in Matthew chapter 21. And we see the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. 
And that was a prophetic type of how glorious it's going to be, uh, or it would have been if Jerusalem had received Jesus as their Messiah and what will happen in the future. And so we see everyone taking off their garments, everybody uh, worshiping and saying Hosanna to the king, Hosanna in the highest. And it's a snapshot of what would happen if one day a whole city came to God, came to Christ, where every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But uh, we see then uh, a type of Jesus visiting. I, I mean, it wasn't a type. He literally visited the city. And we see that throughout the Bible, there are visitations of Christ. And this is why when we say the second coming of Christ, for example, we have to be careful. We say the second bodily return of Christ, because there are many comings of Christ. Jesus said to one of the churches in the book of Revelation, I think it's chapter three, verse seven, if you don't repent, I'm going to come like a thief in the night. Well, we've been trained to think that the thief in the night is the rapture. Well, that's not true. It's anytime Jesus comes, uh, he's coming first and foremost to visit his people, to analyze them, to either bless them or, or purge them and judge them. And so here we see Jesus visiting Jerusalem. Uh, we see also in the Old Testament how the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, theophany, a Trinitarian theophany, appeared to Abraham in Genesis 18 and uh, wanted to know if the cry that was coming from Sodom was true or not. So they visited Sodom. Of course, it resulted in judgment. We see the same thing, as I mentioned, uh, Jesus visited. He walked in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, Revelation 2 and 3, which are the, the churches of Asia Minor. And out of the seven churches, five were severely reproved, and at least uh, two of them, he warned that he would remove their lampstand if they didn't repent. So when we talk about a visitation from God, he doesn't always visit the way we want. It's not always revival and healing. Sometimes it's correction, purging, uh, church splits could, could even be part of it. It could be an exodus from the church, could be purging, getting people out of the church. Uh, and, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, you might have had God visit your church many times and you didn't think and didn't recognize it was a visitation because it didn't result in church growth, healing and renewal. But oftentimes, perhaps most of the time, starting in the book of Exodus, when God visits, uh, like he visited Egypt, it, it resulted in judgment and purging. Tells us in Malachi chapter three, that when Jesus appears in his temple, he's going to come suddenly. He says, uh, the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, like a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord as in the days of old. I will come near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, adulterers, perjurers, against those who exploit earners and widows and orphans, those who turn away an alien. So we see here uh, a prophecy of Jesus in Malachi coming suddenly to his temple, which we see in many cases in the Gospels. And we could argue maybe he's primarily talking about this instance. Uh, because he also came and overturned the tables of the money changers. So we see him throwing out the hypocritical religious leaders. We see that Jesus didn't get excited because everybody worshiped him, that everybody shouted Hosanna, uh, that the whole city was filled, that there was a big crowd. He doesn't get excited with big crowds. There was a big crowd in Luke 14. Um, and Jesus turned around and said to them, if you don't hate your father and mother in your own life, you cannot be my disciple and you can't follow me. Jesus is not impressed with large crowds. He's impressed with people who are catechized, discipled, who walk in holiness, who walk in the fear of the Lord, 
who walk in humility. He's not impressed with people who violate one or seven of the abominable sins uh, mentioned in Proverbs 6, haughtiness, uh, eyes that wink, bodies that are haughty, uh, pride, arrogance, bloodletting, all these things. And you have the church filled with people who are practicing in their heart or in behavior these sins, uh, which are abomination to God. And, uh, and, and we think that God's pleased because you have 5,000 people in the church. Uh, but when Jesus really visits, he does bring division. He brings a sword and he purges. And we have to understand that before prophetic fulfillment, there is a purging in our life. That's why the name of the book is, is the purpose and process of, of prophetic ministry, because there's a really great process, as you all know, uh, anytime we get a word or anytime we want to walk in the fulfillment of, of the word of God. And I'll, I'll share what I've gone through myself in a moment. So prophetically speaking, uh, the Lord tests us and we undergo a test proportional to the word that we received. So I know, you know, we get excited when we get a word, you know, God has called you to be an apostle to the nations or an apostle to Israel or you know, he's called you to transform your city, whatever the word is, you get all excited. But, you know, as we look at the ways of God and, and, and what happens is you could expect a huge purging and test before that word is fulfilled. So the level of testing and spiritual warfare we undergo is proportional to our calling and to the word of the Lord over our life and assignment. Again, this is all my book. This is one of the chapters of the book. For example, regarding the life and trials of Joseph, we read in Psalm 105, verse 17 to 19, it says that he had sent a man ahead of them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. His feet were hurt with fetters. His neck was put in a collar of iron until what he said came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. Wow. That's Psalm 105, verse 17 and 19. Put that in your Bible, highlight it in yellow, you know, underline it. Because when you get a word, be ready, hang on to your seat, okay? Uh, and so practically speaking, if you get a word about being prosperous, it's an invitation from God to sacrifice, work diligently, study, be creative, get out of debt, give tithes and offerings to God improve your knowledge of wealth management. God doesn't just supernaturally rain money on us from heaven. So while we're praying and preparing for wealth, we're likely to be tested in our faith regarding our finances before that comes to pass. Uh, you get a word, you know, new Christian, they get a word, they call to preach. But it says in James 3, 1, that those who teach will be judged more strictly so they're going to go through a lot of tests and trials before God puts them in, in front of people to represent him and speak the oracle. Um, of course, man puts a lot of people up that God didn't put up, which is part of the reason why we're in a mess in many churches. Um, and then let's say God gives you a word that you're called to get married. Well, that's an invitation to prepare by devouring books on marriage, getting advice, preparing to sacrifice and die to self. A call to be an apostle or pastor is an invitation to get mentored by a spiritual leader, learn the word of God, die to self, and practice living a life of sacrifice for others, not just about preaching under the anointing. Uh, and so we see all of this in scripture. The whole book of Proverbs is it talks about a preparation for prudence, wisdom, uh, the accumulation of wisdom and knowledge so that we could walk in a way that is pleasing to God. Of course, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Uh, and so going back to this story of the uh, triumphal entry of Christ, uh, we see Jesus uh, also spoke about deconstructing the priestly temple, uh, the temple system, which was a prediction related to the future invasion of Roman armies, resulting in the desecration of the temple and destruction of Jerusalem, which took place in AD 70. So you could see that in Luke 21, verse 5 to 21, where he calls the abomination of desolation the Roman armies surrounding the temple, uh, although many people believe the abomination of desolation is yet to come, is in the future. I don't know what Bible they're reading. That had to do with the armies of Rome invading and setting up 
banners of Rome in the most holy place and sacrificing there. I mean, it was just all of that was fulfilled, although you could see something uh, like that metaphorically in the future with or without a temple being built. Uh, and so we see Jesus uh, getting praised, but right after he was praised, he overturns the table of the money changes, um, which you could argue has to do with judging the commercialization of the gospel. And boy, have we seen that in the America, the American church. We've seen um, how uh, the Romans took the gospel and institutionalized it. The Greeks took the gospel and philosophized it. And the Americans took the gospel and monetized it. You see every culture turning the gospel into something else. Well, what does Jesus think of? I'm not saying pastors shouldn't receive a good salary or anything like that, but what does Jesus think of the monetization of the things of God? Well, we don't have to look further than the time he walked into the temple, overturned the tables of the money changes. Uh, I mean, that man had incredible strength, boldness. He took out a cord of whips before Indiana Jones ever did it. He had a whip on him and started whipping the behinds of people. Uh, you can't tell me Jesus was like a flower child who walked around with, you know, saying peace, peace all the time. He was a man's man, and he exerted uh, and expressed his anger at times, especially against the religious hypocrites and those who would uh, rob the temple by robbing the people uh, who walked a long way to sacrifice animals. And uh, they took advantage of them and, and sold them for a, a high price. So they monetized the things of God, and they, they did it for profit. And so we see Jesus not being impressed by the crowds, Jesus examining the temple and saying, you see all this beautiful buildings, not one stone will remain upon another. All of it will be torn down. He was talking about the deconstruction of religious system. When Jesus visits, he deconstructs our religious system that doesn't bear fruit, that doesn't please him, that doesn't honor him. Anything that's in our church that can be shaken will be shaken and has been shaken the last two years. 72% of the pastors are looking for another job, according to what Mark Estes said last week on the table. Uh, uh, many pastors have quit anything. So many people have left that church, some will never come back. Uh, you know, you could say, well, we, we need a revival. Well, maybe that was God's prerequisite for a revival. Maybe some of these people were hurting the church. Maybe he had to reveal their hearts. Maybe we couldn't go for, forward with some of the same people. I mean, you could argue Jesus hurt the temple because he overturned the table to money change. He threw people out. He wasn't bringing them in. He threw them out. Uh, and uh, so we could argue that, well, I mean, Jesus was hurting church growth right there, right? Uh, but uh, who's to say God didn't answer with revival or renewal or the prerequisite for it? He did visit us in the last year and a half. And uh, 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 and the fact that our church attendance is still meager in most cases doesn't mean God didn't visit us. We're still waiting for an awakening or revival because our knowledge of Scripture is very dim because uh, the light bulbs haven't gone off yet because we don't understand the ways of God. We don't understand the scriptures. We don't understand what it means when it says God visits us. When Jesus comes, he inspects for fruit. Five out of the seven churches were rebuked and warned and told to repent from the great height from where they have fallen. Uh, two of them, I'll remove your lampstand. When a church closes, it's not the devil who closes the church because the gates of hell cannot stand against the church. Jesus is the one who closes churches. Some of these churches should have never been open. If 50% of the churches closed in America, the communities would probably not even notice it. Maybe 80%. I don't know. Who am I? I'm not God. I'm just trying to understand the ways of God. Maybe uh, uh, I'm wrong in these stats, uh, and that's not the point. The point is we have to redefine visitation. It can't just be for healing and renewal and revival. And when we don't see that, we actually think God's not really moving. Well, he may be moving. He's visiting you as a chiropractor. Before you're healed, the chiropractor is going to tweak your, your neck. He's going to do crazy things. He's going to move your back, and you're going to scream in agony before you get healed. 
and sometimes God visits like a chiropractor. So we see these cycles throughout church history. We see the early church persecuted before there was a time of refreshing, uh, before uh, 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 Paul was converted in Acts 9, there was not a lot of time of refreshing uh, uh, until he was converted. And you see that the, the, the church has experienced a time of refreshing and renewal and comfort in the Holy Ghost. Uh, I think it's Acts 9.31. But you see persecution, rabid persecution before that in Acts chapter 6 and 7. God used it to purge his church and to glorify his servant Stephan, who Jesus actually stood up he, he, instead of being seated at the right hand of the Father, he stood up to receive Stephan. Wow. He gave Stephan a standing ovation because he remained true to the word of God in spite of persecution. Uh, so we see the Acts 8 persecution uh, preceded. Um, the Acts 8 persecution came on the heels of a great revival there. Uh, and uh, we see God moving in these cycles, we see the, the post-apostolic church seeing great hardship. Uh, people like uh, Ignatius was martyred. Justin was called Justin Martyr because he was martyred. Uh, many people like Polycarp, who said, uh, for 80 and six years, the Lord has been faithful to me. I will not deny him now. And uh, he pleaded with them to uh, burn him alive. And when they went to tie him up, he said, the Lord who stood with me all these years will also stand with me where I won't need these ropes. And he literally kept standing while the fires consumed his body. And so we see these amazing persecutions before Constantine gets converted in 312 AD. And then the church had a place of prominence and favor. Of course, they misused and abused that. The persecuted then became the persecutors. And then other things happened, uh, resulting, of course, the biggest uh, deconstruction. And uh, there's so many throughout history, but to not bore you so we could finish this uh, in, in this one session, this chapter, I'm just doing a quick read through chapter 15. Uh, of course, we see the Protestant Reformation totally deconstruct Catholicism, especially judging the monetization of the gospel with the sale of indulgences. And so we see there again, God coming into his temple and overturning the table to money changes, so to speak, with the judgment on the Roman Catholic system, especially the monetization of, of uh, the gospel, the holy things of God, where they didn't discern between the holy and the profane, as we see in Ezekiel chapter 44 and 43. So the Protestant Reformation then became the precondition for many centuries of various renewal movements, gospel expansion, uh, culminating in the modern missions movement, evangelical revivals, great awakening starting in the 18th century, resulting eventually in the Pentecostal movements throughout the world that produced various revivals and unprecedented global expansion of the gospel in the 20th century. All of this wouldn't have been possible if God didn't severely judge the Roman Catholic system and deconstruct it. And so we wouldn't be where we are now. Uh, then we see in that same chapter that Jesus went and inspected the tree for fruit. And he went to a fig tree. He didn't see any fruit on it. And then he cursed the fig tree. Uh, again, we see Jesus expects fruit. And that fig tree had to do with symbolizing Israel. And he was saying, I've given you all this time and you still don't receive me. You still haven't borne fruit. 400 years of prophetic silence, not having a prophet, although they had sages and wise men who moved up in the ranks and gave them interpretations of the Torah and the prophets. Uh, the, Qum, the Qumran community had some great leaders and the Maccabees and all that. But after all this time, after all this time, he's still not bearing fruit. He said, I'm going to give it to another nation that'll bear fruit. Of course, he was talking about the new Jerusalem, new Israel, the combination of both Jew and Gentile in the church. Um, but he cursed the fig tree. And uh, we see that in Matthew 21, verse 43 and 44. So Jesus is saying, this is not a prophetic game. 
Uh, we can't just say yes to God and think we're satisfying him. He doesn't care how many people shout amen in your church. He cares about how many people are dying of self and walking in covenant. The word amen is a covenantal term anyway. It means uh, bless me if I obey the word of the Lord, and may I have the consequences if I don't follow through on it. So the word amen is a covenantal term. It means, yes, Lord, uh, do what you want in my life. I'm pledging to do what you want. Uh, in my life. So when someone shouts amen, they're actually putting themselves under an oath to God to obey him. So Jesus's authority was then challenged after this. And uh, I have learned that everybody's authority, so to speak, will be challenged after they receive a prophetic word. For example, every prophetic word I've ever received from the Lord has been challenged by at least one of the following. Again, this is in my chapter 15 of this new book. First and foremost, I'm challenged by my own thoughts. Almost immediately after God speaks something profound or I get a profound prophetic word, within the hour, I get attacks in my mind trying to rationalize how this can't happen. Um, I get attacked in my mind. My biggest challenge opposing me is my own self-doubt or unbelief in God's word. Um, and those are the greatest strongholds, according to 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3 to 5. It says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And then he says what the strongholds are, casting down every thought and every imagination that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. So the primary stronghold is not demons. It's your own mind and your own thoughts that don't line up with God's word. And Satan's main arena for warfare is not your body, not your finances, it's your mind. So that's the first thing that challenges your authority when you get a prophetic word. Uh, then you have satanic interference. Obviously, there will be spiritual warfare opposing you at every step of the way, especially when you start to change. Uh, I have found, and I wrote in uh, one of my books, and there's an article out there somewhere, that your spiritual warfare, the intensity and level of spiritual warfare is always going to be commensurate to your assignment. So those who have greater call will, uh, will undergo greater spiritual warfare. That's why uh, we see in Acts chapter 9, after Paul got saved, and Ananias said, Lord, this man is persecuting your church. And God's answer, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. And he even said himself in 2 Corinthians 12, that because of the exceeding greatness of the revelations given to him, God had to assign a thorn of flesh and it had nothing to do with sickness. He described what it was, a messenger of Satan to buffet him. 2 Corinthians eleven seventeen 17 on in the context shows us what the messenger of Satan was, the thorn in the side. Uh, in the Old Testament had to do with outside persecution against God's people. And in 2 Corinthians eleven seventeen 17 on, thorn in the flesh was clearly not demon, uh, not uh, physical affliction, but had to do with being shipwrecked, being stoned several times, being whipped, uh, in danger from robbers, ban ba bandits, uh, rivers, and false brethren. I mean, he explains what that was. So God actually allowed circumstances to be incredibly and exceedingly difficult so that he would remain humble because of the greatness of the revelations given to him. So the greater your calling, the more suffering and the more you'll have to endure. Uh, so satanic interference, the other things that happen, of course, people not coming through in their promises, circumstances seem to go against every prophetic word. For example, if you receive a word about having a healing ministry, uh, you might get attacked with sickness or prosperity, you might lose your job. These are all tests to see if our authority is in our circumstances or faith in God. Um, and so we notice in Luke 20, 18, uh, when they asked him, who gave you your authority? Jesus never even told them. He never stooped down to defend himself or get upset because others didn't receive him because faith was in his father very powerful stuff. And so uh, as we wrap this up, 
we are in trust by a period of faithfulness. I'm going to ask uh, Robert Gay to weigh in on, and he, he read my book already. He's another one who endorsed it. And uh, as a person who moves a lot in the prophetic, uh, and Kyle Searcy also read it. Any thoughts that you have, gentlemen, on what I've shared? Uh, we'll start with you, Robert. You have to unmute yourself. Robert, are you there? All right, am I, can you hear me now? Yeah. All right, well, first of all, Bishop Joe, it's just great to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. And I'd like to just say amen and absolutely to everything that you shared. It's just tremendous, tremendous word. And um, I read the book. I think the book is absolutely wonderful. It's powerful, it's revelatory. And uh, one of the things that I've been promoting uh, really since last year is that those that are in the prophetic to take a, a, a look inside, to have a moment of introspection, to let us really examine things uh, very uh, clearly. And I believe that's one of the things that your book does. It brings to light a lot of things that I believe every person in the prophetic, regardless of how long you've been flowing in prophetic ministry, these are things that we need to actually look at ourselves and uh, I know we've done it within our church. We've examined every area where we have the prophetic flowing and uh, within our church and make sure that we're doing things correctly, uh, because sometimes you can get in a flow uh, just because, well, you've seen it done. Uh, but, you know, we need to have a solid biblical foundation for everything that we're doing uh, as far as the operation of the prophetic within the local church. And so um, I highly recommend the book and uh, the, many of the uh, principles, of course, that you teach on are also contained within the prophetic standard statement. It's really an elaboration of many of those things, uh, which once again, I believe were just absolutely wonderful. As you were sharing, though, uh, just a couple of things that, you know, I was jotting down a few notes and uh, such rich, rich uh, understanding and teaching and uh, just explanation. But one of the things that I've always taught our uh, people in our church is it comes out of Isaiah 55, where it talks about the word of the Lord, the word of God. It, it comes, the word that comes out of the mouth of God is like rain that comes down from heaven. It waters the earth and then makes it bud and then makes it blossom. And I believe that speaks specifically of the process of the prophetic. In other words, you don't get a prophetic word and then all of a sudden, you know, tomorrow, uh, you see that thing to, to full fruition. Uh, prophecy points us in a direction of which we have to begin to apply ourselves. It doesn't necessarily uh, cause us to be transformed within 24 hours and actually doing whatever the prophecy said that we were going to do. So uh, when you talk about the, the process of the prophetic, and again, there were so many wonderful things that you shared. And uh, there was a, a a preacher that said this many, many years ago, and I don't even remember which who it was, but I put it to memory. And he said this, every front door revival begins with a back door exodus, you know, and many times before we see growth on uh, as far as a front door revival and see what we what many times we have traditionally defined as revival, it may start out with this pruning. It'll start out with the things that need to be removed. And again, that's just a part of the prophetic process. I know we've seen that happen even within our own lives. Uh, I'll just give you a quick little, uh, and I'll have to condense it. But in 1988, we, we, in February of 88, we received a prophetic word how that we would have a daughter who would be a dancer in the house of the Lord. And then the beginning of March, we received three more prophetic words about us having another child. And uh, anyway, at the end of March, uh, we found out that my wife was pregnant. And we were, you know, happy and thrilled about this. But then by the begin, uh, end of April, she was bleeding real heavily. And so we went to the doctor and the doctors told her, said, you have a, a, a blighted ovum. And basically what happens with an blighted ovum is pregnancy takes place. And then literally the embryo just dies on the vine. She was bleeding heavily. They said, we want you to, to come in, have a DNC. And, the, and uh, as soon as we heard about this, we made a decision that we were going to stand and believe the word of the Lord. Because one of the things the prophetic will do is it will pre-equip you and pre-arm you for the warfare that is uh, that you don't see right now, but is down the road. 
And so we began to take that word and we began to war good warfare. And I remember uh, daily, we would, I would lay my hands upon her stomach and I would say, you will live and not die. You will live and not die. And we kept pro proclaiming that. And obviously, other people were praying uh, for us at that moment in time. I was on staff with Christian International, um, with Bishop Hammond and, and uh, Apostle Tom Hammond and all, all the, the CI staff. Uh, but anyway, so they were all praying. We're all believing together. But we had to take the word of the Lord and begin to warfare. Anyway, uh, in June, we went back to the doctor. And, and when we went back to the doctor, the doctor put his um, the sonogram thing. I don't even know what they, it, it, the, the technology is more advanced than what it was back then. But anyway, it was a heartbeat monitor. And he heard the swishing of the heartbeat. And whenever he heard the swishing of the heartbeat, he jumped back in total disbelief. And to make a long story short, our daughter was born December 6th of that year, 1988. So what I'm saying in all this is there's a process uh, for fulfillment of every prophetic word that we receive. And you, we'll go through times of pruning, times of checking, times where the Lord will be taking things off of us in the midst of the process and also causing our faith to be developed and become stronger. So uh, once again, I would just uh, commend you for writing the book. I believe it's something that is needed in the body of Christ today. I know it's something that we're going to uh, actually uh, distribute among our prophetic leaders uh, within our church. Uh, we want everyone to be able to get a copy of this because I believe it'll be a great asset to the church and also will um, help us avoid some of the things that we encountered even within the past year. And uh, I, one of the things that, uh, you know, the Lord showed me years ago is that the stronger the anointing is upon someone's life. And I believe the prophetic anointing has such power, such power to produce, such power to edify. We know that, as a matter of fact, it is the one gift we are specifically commanded to covet. Uh, of all the gifts, we're commanded to covet the gift of prophecy. So it is the one gift I would say that probably has the greatest ability to build up and make the church strong, to make believers strong, to equip us for what God has for us. Uh, but because of the power of that anointing, the more powerful the anointing and the greater the gift, the more and stronger the parameters must be. It's the same way I can give somebody a, a double A battery and you can throw it around the room, but you can't give somebody 220 electrical power and throw that around the room. The parameters become greater. Electricians have to wire uh, things specifically when uh, the voltage is stronger, uh, when, it's, uh, when it's elevated. And I believe one of the things that all prophets and prophetic people need to realize is that the greater that the Lord desires to use you and the greater the anointing and the greater the power that's going to flow through you, it, it doesn't mean that you have greater freedom to do whatever you want to do. It means the parameters that you operate within actually become more defined and become greater because the words that you speak, they have more power. They have the ability to either the, the same words that can bring life can also bring destruction and devastation. So we have to realize that as those who operate within the prophetic, that we have something very powerful that dwells on the inside of us. And so we must actually steward that very carefully. And I believe, I said all that to say, I believe your book helps uh, prophetic people, prophets, um, and those who have any type of desire to flow in the prophetic, understand it to a greater level, and then be able to steward that anointing. Wow. Wow. Powerful, powerful. Um, not sure if Kyle is still on because um, he said he's trying to get on, but he got cut off. So, uh, anybody have any comments on this that you want to, you have a question or a comment about what myself or Robert shared? Comments, the floor is open. Hey, Bishop, uh, this is a, a quick question for you. Um, this topic obviously is so needed. Um you made a statement that it's going to help us as pastors uh, to nourish and protect our, our local churches and environments. Not having read the book yet, would you recommend that this is the type of book that we as senior leaders should read? 
and then strategically distill certain points out of it to our teams? Or is yeah. this a book that we would give to uh, to our leaders in a church to just have them digest themselves and then do discussion? How, how, how deep does it go? How would you recommend do we distill this information through the ranks so that that health is going throughout the whole body, or at least at the leader level, you know, of the teams? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I believe you could actually take this book and it has Q&A at the end of each chapter. And you could do small group Bible studies with it, or you could condense it into a one day school of the prophets. You have all the notes there. You can make it a school of the prophets. Um, you could, um, a, uh, I would, of course, read it yourself first if you want. Uh, I think most people know my heart and what I believe. So I don't think you'll, you're taking a chance if you buy a copy for all your church and give it out. Um, and uh, the, uh, the fact of the matter is um, it's not just a typical book on the prophetic. It deals a lot with the apostolic uh, because the prophetic alone is not balanced. So there's one chapter dealing with how to build a healthy prophetic culture in your church. There's another chapter on understanding apest churches. So we're always talking about the individual gift of prophet, apostle, et cetera, but we don't understand there are actually prophetic churches. There are apostolic churches. There are evangelistic churches. So how to understand the apest gift your churches and how to utilize other apest gifts, apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, teacher, to strengthen your weaknesses and complement your, your church and your movement. So it's, dealing a lot with the wine, wine skin, not just the wine. Uh, and it also shows the difference between the contemporary prophet and, and apostle. It, it brings a lot of clarity um, with the distinguishing between the gifts. So I would say at the very least, you could give it out to all of your leaders and mature Christians um, and, uh, and, but I would say that uh, it's probably not that complicated that anybody who uh, in, in the church could read it. And if they have questions, you know, it could be unpacked uh, with, with the leader. I hope that answers your question. Oh, and by the way, the prophetic standard statement is in the back of the book too. So yeah. that also yeah, that does. is important. Yeah. Thank you, Bishop. Sure. Anybody else question or comment? Yeah, Bishop, can you elaborate? Are you going to have a portion in there that helps um, delineate between canonical prophecy and non-canonical? In other words, conditional versus unconditional. You know, when people will say, you know, the Second Chronicles 714 principle, if my people. So where a prophet or a prophecy or an utterance can be accurate accurately from the lord but because it's conditional if people don't obey or pray and i know you've said this in not so few words other times but is it possible to be uh still have a true prophetic utterance or be a true prophetic voice and something not come to pass which may seem like it was false but if parameters prophetically were not uh obeyed uh, verses, admonitions, caveats that God's promise or blessing being conditional did not come to pass. I think that's a, a sliver and a nuance there that people are either extreme on one for the other. And I don't know if they have embodied the balance on that. Yeah. Well, even this chapter shows that prophecies are conditional, like I just shared you get a prophecy about prosperity, doesn't mean it's going to happen automatically. There are conditions. So I just shared on that. And then uh, there's other chapters. There's so many things having to do with guidelines and principles in the book. Plus the prophetic standard statement deals with that specific issue. Um, that, uh, yeah, I think all these things are, are dealt with uh, in detail 
so that if someone goes through the book, it will easily be a godrail without quenching the spirit. I mean, I think it's a pastor's best friend in this day and age of crazy prophetic stuff. Uh, it's It'll be the pastor's best friend, but also be the prophet's best friend because it'll inspire prophets and it will also help them uh, understand the one of the things that makes this so different from most other books, perhaps all of them, I don't know, I'm not claiming to read all the books ever written on the prophetic, is this book has a strong ecclesiology. Throughout the whole book is that apostolic thread of, of, of ecclesiology. You know, you can't function. There's one chapter that shows how the gifts of the Spirit are sandwiched between instructions on communion, 1 Corinthians 11, love, and then guidelines in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians that have to do with submitting your word to other prophetic people or spiritual leaders. It shows the corporality of the prophetic and how uh, you can't separate 1 Corinthians 12, gifts of the Spirit, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, prophecy, discerning of spirit, gifts of healings, working of miracles. Uh, you can't separate that from the rest of the chapter that says, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, that we're all one body. So it has a very, very strong ecclesiology. It's why it'll help your people, not just in the prophetic, help them get committed to your church, understand that individual destiny is not biblical, how they need the body. So it won't just help with the prophetic, but it'll help in general understanding of how our vision should be expressed uh, through the local church. Kyle, you read through the book. Uh, I, I was trying to get you to give you a yeah. take on some, some things. Yeah, I, I, I know our time is limited. Uh, I love the book. It's timely. It's a manual that will, I think, end a lot of the chaos that we have. And I love the way it's written. And I love the fact that it is full of ecclesiology. It's enough theology in it that it's very sound, but it's practical. So well done. I agree with you. It's probably one of the better books you've written. I did have a question, and I know I only have a chance to drop a seed uh, in here, but I, I want you to maybe address it some other time. I want to know how you write. When you write, uh, do you have a target audience in mind? Are you just depending on re a revelational flow? Are you answering kind of like theological questions that just drop in your heart? Um, just your, your whole process of writing and how you produce books is something I'm interested in learning about. Yeah, well, before we transition to the next table, I feel such a burden to write that it's a weight on me. And it's like being in a ball and chain that I have to finish the book and get it done. Uh, or, you know, I have to, I have one book in me that I have to write before I die. That's how I feel. You know, if I had one book left, because I don't know when, when God's going to take me home. If I had one book left, what would I write? That's how I approach it. Cause I could write on a bunch of things. You know, I've been around for 42 years and, been a pastor and preached on uh, every subject, you know. Uh, but what book do I have in me that I want to release before I die that's different from the other books that's unique, that'll be a unique contribution to the conversation of the kingdom? Uh, I just uh, sent Victor a link, and we'll, we could do this uh, throughout. But if you want to copy and paste this link, you could start promoting the book and uh sharing it but victor you could did you post the link i don't even know if you did or not let me see i'm working on it i'm working on it. Oh, okay it. yeah uh in the meantime we're supposed to transition to the next table uh so joe the book is currently available on amazon as of now okay great yeah great <laughs> it's not available on my website yet um but uh should be uh it's definitely available on on amazon okay yeah so we're waiting to put the ability to buy the book on my website we're waiting until uh until monday when we're going to go all out and try to start promoting the book hey bishop yes my apologies for coming on a little later. Uh, where do you post these videos? Uh, I see it's recording right now. 
I know the global table um, at 11 is posted on Facebook, uh, US Cal, but this one. Well, the one, the one that we just had. Yes, sir. Uh, I don't have Vince Thomas on. It's supposed to be posted on ChristCovenantCoalition.com. ChristCovenantCoalition.com. And okay. uh, also, I, I, release, yeah. I release these through podcast as well. Your personal podcast. What is the name of your podcast, please? Just my name, Joseph Matera. I'm not Just very sure. not very creative. <laughs> All right. I, I know we had this conversation before about the uh, website and not having access to. Uh, you got cut off there, Kyle. What were you saying? We're going to have to rebrand that podcast, the Jay Maddie podcast, something catchy like that. <laughs> <laughs> I need hope. I mean, I need help in that because my daughter called it the Joseph Matera show. And my wife hates the name. She said, it's not a show. What are you doing? Uh, Jay Maddie, man. I can't think of anything else. <laughs> Jay Maddie works. I'm with you on that, Bishop. Jay Maddie, there you go. <laughs> that's a brief old witness. Oh, man, that's funny. Uh, okay, well, let's um, transition to the next table. Vince Thomas is at the doctor's with his wife, a routine checkup, so nothing serious there, and he wasn't sure if he can get on on time. So let's... Um, Let's transition to the next table. Uh, Lord, we thank you, God, for this table. We thank you for everything you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay. So we want to welcome yes. all of you to the global table. Yes, I did. And, yep, I don't know what Elliot did, but if you're not talking, if you can mute yourself, that'd be great. And uh, it's all good. It's all fun. So thank you for being a part of this. This, I thought I, this week I was the only one not on vacation. 80% of all my leaders in the church are away. So uh, <laughs> so you are the special chosen ones that aren't away this week, I guess. But uh, it's so good to see all of you. Hopefully you're all still in the faith, born again, married, uh, whatever you are. Hopefully God is still blessing you and I'm trusting he is. Um so before we start, I'm going to ask Victor Nazario. Uh, oh, wait a minute. We're supposed to post this live. I'm making believe Vince Thomas is in my ear right now telling me what to do. So we're going to live stream this. So watch your language. No cussing from this point on. No smoking cigars and drinking in public. Uh so it's being live streamed right now. And we want to welcome you to the Global Table. Every Thursday at this time, Eastern Time, 11 o'clock, we meet. And it's automatically uploaded to uscal.us after this session is over. Uh, and I'm really excited, uh, perhaps almost more than any book I've ever released, that my new book on the prophetic is now out. It's called The Purpose, Power, and process of prophetic ministry, the purpose, power, and process of prophetic ministry. Um, I started compiling data on this book about three years ago. I sensed the Lord called me to write a book on the prophetic. I've written one on the apostolic. You uh, are P -O -E. and, and I've written, uh, you know, this will be, I guess, the 13th book I'm re releasing. R. And we... Uh, we're on vacation and in, in Florida in January, actually it was a working vacation. And I felt the Lord compel me in uh, late January to write the book. And so I took many hours every day for a week. And of course I've had to edit it since and do a lot more work, but the rough draft of it was ready uh, because of all the work I'd done prior. And to me, this book will be the pastor's best friend. It's the only book I know of that inspires prophetic ministry with a strong ecclesiology. That is to say, it shows very clearly through careful biblical exegesis that prophetic ministry, except for prophetic evangelism, should not be done outside of the context of uh, the church, the local church. So 
it's a, an important book. Uh, it will protect your church from the prophetic excess, at the same time inspire them. And as I said in the last table, you could use this book for a seminar. You could do a school of the prophets with the book. Uh, it's contemporary. It's up to speed with some of the latest stuff that had to be critiqued with social media prophets and uh, the Trump prophecies and all of this. But the book is not primarily about that. There's only two chapters on that. Uh, it really gives guidelines. It also shows how to have prophetic balance, how to develop a prophetic culture in the church. And it shows uh, very clearly how Apest, apostle, prophet, evangelist, teacher, and shepherd uh, become wineskins, not just individual gifts, and how your church is either apostolic, prophetic, evangelistic, shepherding, or teaching, and how we utilize all the gifts to work together. So this book will be uh, out on my website this Monday. It's already available on Amazon, and I'm very, very excited about it. It also has the prophetic standard statement in the back to uh, end in the website to back up uh, the fact that the principles have been established by many, many leaders in the body of Christ. Um, and so what I want to do today is... I want to share from one chapter in the book, one chapter in the book. The next two weeks, we're going to take different chapters. Uh, next week, I'll have Dr. Michael Brown. And then uh, the week after, uh, well, I think next week might be Mark Sharoner and the week after Michael Brown. Um, okay. But anyway, uh, so what I want to do is talk about 10 reasons why I'm not a cessationist, 10 reasons why. I'm not a cessationist. This is from chapter 10 in my book, 10 reasons why I'm not a cessationist. And so when we think about cessationism, uh, we're thinking about a view in the fundamentalist church starting, uh, I think around the time of John Calvin, where they believe that the gifts of the spirit no longer were in operation and that God doesn't speak at all outside of his written word. Uh, those who believe in God speaking to them were called mystics in the uh, early church. And uh, this chapter is called The Case for Christian Mysticism. The Case for Christian Mysticism and 10 Reasons Why God Still Speaks Today. So again, reading from this chapter a little bit, and then I'll expound on it. The American Heritage Dictionary describes mysticism as a belief in the existence of realities beyond perceptual or intellectual apprehension that are central to being and directly accessible by subjective experience. So that's a dictionary of the word mystical. Uh, my model for ministry all my life has been the Apostle Paul because he was both an intellectual who God used as a Christian apologist, but he was also a quote-unquote mystic because God appeared to him and spoke to him. Unfortunately, many ministers today are either intellectually astute or spir and spiritually dry. That is to say, they're not mystical. They don't have a prayer life. They don't have a, a regular experiential relationship with God. Uh, but they focus more on doctrine. And then you have those who are uh, totally mystical, who have no doctrinal stability and soundness. Consequently, uh, the Bible teaches us to walk in spirit and in truth, as Jesus said in John chapter 4. Related to those who are cessationists, we have those in the Christian fundamentalist camp, including some Baptists, Calvinists, and evangelicals, primarily um, uh, European, uh, but uh, it, it is in every aspect of European descent, and uh, especially the, the Calvinists and the Dutch Calvinists reformed, all of these, these guys, but uh, they espouse a doctrine of cessationism. Um, they teach that once God spoke in his son, as we see in Hebrews 1, 2, it implies that the canon of scripture was closed, so it tells us in Hebrews 1 uh, that God uh, spoke to us, uh, spoke to the prophets, to the elders, through the prophets. 
but in these last days he's spoken to us in his son so their interpretation of that was jesus spoke in the gospels uh, through the epistles that's it he doesn't speak anymore no need for prophets but is that what it's really saying in hebrews 1 i would disagree with that interpretation so once god spoke to us in his son according to them the canon of scripture, all subjective communication outside of the scriptures, including the revelatory gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, which are tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy, words of knowledge, wisdom, supernatural miracles, healing, all of that have ceased. And that's why you get the word cessationist. They believe these gifts and God speaking to us has ceased since the total canon of scripture has been completed. And we're going to get to why that's a fallacy in a minute. Um, so as a charismatic Bible teacher, as I said, I strongly disagree, even though I have degrees in higher learning, uh, spent more than 40 years reading books on theology, church history, apologetics, and beyond. I would still be considered a mystic by many in the body of Christ because I live a life trying to discern the experiential voice of God. Uh, whether it's through the scriptures or through a spiritual understanding of what the Holy Spirit is saying through others or in my own spirit. I remember one time I did a seminar uh, and a bunch of theologians were there. And this one guy came up to me and he said, man, I've been mentored by John Stott and John Frame, and I never heard anything like this. Where did you ever learn all this? And I said, do you really want to know? He said, yeah. I gave him my book, Travail to Prevail. I said, read this and you'll understand it. I feel like the Holy Spirit is the great magisterium, a teacher of the church. There's illumination that comes with the spirit and through reading church history and the fathers and dialogue with others. And uh, uh, the spirit is our great teacher. So um, so the stuff I was teaching, I, I, I actually, of course, I got ideas from other books and all that, but the spirit of God gave me insight and 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 that's the the seminar i was doing was was i think it was the wine skin in the kingdom or something so anyway the point is uh i gave an interpret interpretive grid for the kingdom that he never heard before and he's blown away uh and i gave him a book on prayer and how prayer releases revelation and insight from the holy spirit i never heard from him again so i'm not sure he liked my answer to his question um but the prophetic has been very profound in my life. For example, I remember the, uh, I had a word from one of the elders in our church in 1998, I think it was, that I was supposed to start a network. And uh, I was probably, what, uh, not even 40. I don't know how old I was. But um, the uh, word I got, I just stored it in my heart. Two weeks later, John Kelly gave me the same word when he and I visited in November of 1998. And uh, I said, wow, I better take this serious. So I blocked out three days in January of two, uh, 1999 to fast and pray whether or not I'm supposed to start a network. And God is my witness. I was about three hours into my fast in the middle of January 1999. When I got a call from an intercessor, I've talked, spoke to once or twice in my life, and uh, she was from um, uh, Maryland, and she said, I see you in the birth canal giving birth to something big and powerful, and it's a network, and, and I said, what? And then I kept praying and fasting, another hour goes by, an intercessor from Texas calls me, gives me, gives me the same word. Then the kicker was about an hour after that, my best friend from Ohio calls me, Lenny Weston, now deceased, um, but great man of God. And he uh, called me and he said, God just told me you're starting a network. How come you didn't talk to me about it? I said, are you kidding me? And I stopped the fast. That was the easiest three-day fast I ever had. Um, didn't even last five hours. I mean, God gave me five confirming words to start Christ's Covenant Coalition. And now it's 22 or 23 years old. It's our private network. So that's just one example. I give you hundreds of how prominent I, I placed the prophetic in my life uh, and how it's had an impact on my own life. Again, this is all in my book. So I want to jump to 10 reasons why cessationism is not biblical. Uh, 10 reasons why cessationism is not biblical. This is from chapter 10 of my new book. Number one, 
it is not reasonable to teach that the completion of the canon of scripture uh, ended after the book of Revelation was written, which would be some scholars say uh, AD 90, some scholars would say it was before the temple was destroyed, which I would agree with. Um, so it would be in the AD, um, AD, before AD 70. But anyway, that being said, uh, it is not reasonable to teach that the completion of the canon of scripture after the book of Revelation was written brought an end to all miracles and to God speaking to us because the full canon of scripture wasn't fully recognized or even known by the universal church until St. Athanasius compiled all the accepted books of the Bible as part of an Easter letter he wrote to the churches. It wasn't until the fourth century that the church universally agreed upon what the canon was. They had sort of a canon, and uh, some accepted the Shepherd of Hermas, some didn't accept the Book of Revelation or Hebrews, but we had sort of a canon by the end of the second century, but it was officially accepted, all 66 books of the Bible after Athanasius' book, a uh, letter rather, to the churches during the Easter season, recognizing all the accepted books. So how could miracles have stopped when they didn't even know what the canon was until the fourth century? It doesn't make sense, that argument. Number two, throughout church history, there's always been a compelling Christian testimony of God speaking personally to individuals in the church and performing miracles. Let's get a taste of some of the early fathers. Justin Martyr, who died in 165 AD, in Justin's dialogue with Trifo, he says in page 82, for the prophetical gifts remain with us even to the present time. More I could say, you could read the book. Irenaeus, who was from 130 AD to 202, second century, and Irenaeus's work against heresies, he writes, those who are in truth, Jesus' disciples, receive grace from him and do in his name perform miracles. Some cast out devils. Uh, people are cleansed from evil spirits. Others still heal the sick by laying their hands on them, and they are made whole. Yea, yea, moreover, as I said, the dead even have been raised and remain among us for many years. That's Irenaeus. How about Tertullian? Tertullian has been called the first Pentecostal theologian because of his later connection with the Montanist sect of the church which was known for moving frequently in the prophetic gifts. Uh, he talks about moving in the gifts of the Spirit, uh, and you could read the book. I quote from him, Oregon lived from 185 to 254 AD. He's known as the first systematic theologian of the church. And by the way, Oregon and Tertullian were both in North Africa, so they were considered Africans great theologians, not white Europeans, who many people think it was the Europeans who were the great theologians. Just want to throw that in there. The greatest theologians of the early church, most of them were Black Africans. Oregon, known as the first systematic theologian of the church, was also uh, one who practiced the gifts of the Spirit. In his book on first principles, he wrote, when, whether by baptism or by the grace of the Spirit, the word of wisdom or the word of knowledge or any other gift has been bestowed upon a man and not rightly administered, either buried in the earth or tied up in a napkin, the gift of the Spirit will certainly be withdrawn from his soul. There's more things he says. Novation, a bishop from 200 to 258, he wrote in the third century, this is he who places prophets in the church instructs teachers, directs tongues, gives powers and healings, does wonderful works, often discrimination of spirits, affords powers of government, suggests counsels and orders, whatever other gifts there are of the charismata, and thus make the Lord's church everywhere and all perfected and completed. That's novation. A century later, Basil the Great, described in his treatise on the Holy Spirit, said, the Spirit enlightens all, inspires prophets, gives wisdom to lawmakers, consecrates priests, empowers kings, perfects the just, exalts the prudent, is active in gifts of healings, gives life to the dead, frees those in bondage, turns foreigners into adopted sons. That was in 350 AD. Cyril or Cyril of Jerusalem, fourth century, 
He wrote, if you believe, you shall not only receive remission of sins, but also do things which pass man's power, and may you be worthy of the gift of prophecy also. There's so many more that we could cite, so that shows that after the apostles, the gifts of the Spirit was still vibrant in the church, after the first century apostles. Also, there is a document that many argue is as early as the 660 A.D., uh, called the Didache. It's a first and second century document used to instruct the churches, and it has guidelines in the Didache. You could download it. It's like 18 pages. has guidelines for traveling prophets, some dated as late as 150 AD. Uh, okay, the Montanists were a group that flourished in the second century and used the gift of prophecy. Uh, letter D, to believe in cessationism, that is to say that God doesn't speak anymore, moving the gifts, is to disregard many heroes of the faith, including, but not limited to, the post-apostolic fathers, and include St. Augustine, 4th century, the Desert Fathers, Anthony and on, the 3rd century on, numerous others who have borne witness to God, doing miracles of healing, deliverance, and speaking to them personally. Many of the great revivalists, evangelists, and preachers of the last few centuries, including D.L. Moody, R.A. Torrey, Charles Finney, Charles Spurgeon, John Wesley, George Whitfield, the Moravians, and even men like Abraham Kuyper, uh, had a healing ministry or experienced miracles of God speaking to them regarding their ministry. Uh, man, read the life story of Charles Finney that he wrote about himself. It's a mind-blowing how the prophetic operated so strongly in his life and in the intercessors that worked with him. All right, that was just point two. We're still on chapter 10 here. That's all has to do with the witness and testimony of the church. Number three, the third reason why I don't believe in cessationism is to teach that God only speaks through the scriptures is to take away a large part of God's personality and function in relationship, in regard to his relationship with his children. After all, how many people do you know who would choose written letters to be the only mode of communication with those they love, like their spouse or children? Can you imagine telling your spouse from now on, you're only to write me letters, and I'll write you letters back or email me. I mean, that would be an insult. And what are we doing to God by telling him he can't speak to us anymore? Number four, saying that the word perfect, which I went to a cessationist Bible school trained by uh, fundamentalist Baptist, uh, my form formative years of being a Christian, that's where I went. God uh, wanted me exposed to all different camps. I was raised in a Pentecostal church, uh, not raised, saved in a Pentecostal church, went to a cessationist Bible school for training in my first two years of being a Christian. So anyway, I heard the arguments. They say that the word perfect in 1 Corinthians 13, 10 refers to the scriptures. Uh, it's saying basically in 1 Corinthians 13, that prophecy in tongues will cease or pass away after that which is perfect comes, which is in 1 Corinthians 13, 10. However, to say that the word perfect only refers to the scriptures, and they also cite James 1, verse 25, where it says the perfect law of liberty is like a mirror, right, that we look. So they're using James 1 uh, and 1 Corinthians 13, 10 to say that perfect means the scriptures, so that once perfect came, once the canon of scripture was fully written, it says tongues will cease. That's what Paul said, they say, First Corinthians 13, tongues and now, uh, prophecy will cease once that which is perfect will come. Of course, they don't throw in the word knowledge. It also said knowledge would cease, okay, which would throw out the Bible too, but that's another story. So, to say that the word perfect in 1 Corinthians 13, 10 only refers to the scriptures does not allow for the possibility of Hebrews 12, 23, where it says that when we're in heaven, we will be the spirits of just men made perfect, okay? Uh, and then 1 John 3, 2, it says that when we see Jesus, we will be like him, but we will see him as he is. If perfect means that God can't speak anymore because the canon of Scripture is complete, 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 in the New, 66 in total, they believe the canon was finished in AD 90, 
then why does the Old Testament refer to itself in Psalm 19.7 as perfect? It says the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. Didn't even have the rest of the canonical books after the book of Psalms, and it was calling itself perfect. So that whole argument, I don't know how smart theologians, and I can mention names, still believe in cessationism. It's not exegetical. It's not plausible. Number five, the fifth reason why I don't believe in cessationism, Paul describes this state of perfection as a time when he, meaning Paul, would know fully just as I have been fully known. First Corinthians 13, 12, he said, after the state of perfection comes, then I will know fully just as I am fully known, which shows that perfection cannot mean the completion of the canon of scripture because Paul in this passage, is speaking about himself. Church history shows us that Paul was beheaded by Nero in about 63 AD, which was way before the canon of Scripture was completed in AD 70 or AD 90 uh, with the book of Revelation. So Paul is saying, when this time of perfection comes, then I will know fully, even as I'm fully known, can't be the canon of scripture because he died before it happened. He said, I will know fully. Well, you're dead. That means it has to refer to heaven, not the completion of scripture. Furthermore, Paul knew even more than the scriptures revealed because in 2 Corinthians 12, God told him he was not allowed to speak of everything he saw in the third heaven. Thus, he could not have been referring to the completion of the canon of scripture when he said that which is perfect will cause tongues to cease, meaning the scriptures. Number six, the sixth reason why I don't believe in cessationism. Again, this is all in chapter 10 of my new book. I don't know of one Christian in all of history who believed that they know fully just as I have been fully known, just by reading the Bible. So Paul says, then when perfection comes, I will know fully, even as I am fully known. I've been reading the Bible for 42 years. I definitely will say, I don't know fully. I don't know one person who knows fully, knows even themselves fully. Never mind the Bible, never mind the ways of God. How could that be referring to the canon of scripture? Uh, even if the scriptures are fully comprehensive regarding God and human nature, we still don't fully understand ourselves until heaven comes, because we are tainted with sin and limited by our flesh. As Paul said, now we know in part and prophesy in part. And Paul said that as a man who knew even more than the scriptures, because he was caught up to heaven, he was not able to say everything he learned. Number seven, seventh reason why I'm not a cessationist, to say that prophecy, tongues, and revelation add to the word of God. They quote Revelation 22, verse 18 and 19. It says, anyone who adds to this book, meanwhile, it's not referring to the whole canon of 66 books. The fundamentalist cessationists don't even understand that. He's only talking about book of Revelation, not the whole canon. But anyway, let's say he's talking about the whole canon. In Revelation 22, it says, if you add to this book, the words to this book, God will add to you the plagues. Or if you take away from the words of this book, God will take away your name from the book of life, right? So they use that in their cessationist argument, uh, and they say that uh, prophecy can't be biblical because you're adding to the word of God, okay? You're adding to the word of God. So what's my response in this book? 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 20 and 21, 1 Corinthians 14, 29, uh, shows that uh, we have to submit prophecy to other people to judge it. Thus, it is not adding or taking away from the scriptures because it is, it is never placed on the same level and authority of scripture. It never tells us to judge scripture, never tells us to weigh scripture to see if it's worthy or not. It says it's inspired of God, profitable for doctrine, for rebuke, for instruction and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work, that's uh, 2 Timothy 3, 15 and 16 and 17, all that. But it doesn't say that about prophecy, right? Prophecy should be judged, not just received. So we're not adding to the word of God in the same way when I read another book about the Bible, I'm not adding to the word of God. 
When I write a book about the Bible, I'm not adding to the Word of God. When I prophesy, I'm not adding to the Word of God. It's a different conversation. We're not putting books and or prophecy or teachings on the same level as a canonical inspired scripture. Number eight, the reason why, another reason why I don't believe in cessationism. Now, this is a deep one. I use this to deconstruct a high-level Presbyterian pastor of a large church in America somewhere. And he was taught as a cessationist in the reform camp. And I know a lot of reform doctrine, studied a lot. So I said to him, this is the argument I use. I said, to say that all subjective illumination is heretical and adds to the Bible or the like is not taken into consideration that the only entity or person that is totally objective in the universe is God. All other things and beings are derivative because they were made either in his image or created by him. Thus, subjectivity can only be judged by a matter of degrees. For example, when a fundamentalist cessationist believes that they are saved, that they, they believe they are saved because they have a witness in their spirit, that is just as subjective as prophecy because the witness they have in their spirit amounts to God telling them personally or giving them a sense that they are a child of God. Also, the idea that a person believes that they are one of the elect is subjective and cannot be objectively proven to be true. Furthermore, what is a word but something that connotes a feeling or a desire? Hence, when someone prophesies, they are only articulating with words a sense of something they feel or believe in their heart. So when someone says that God speaks to them only through the scriptures, this means that there must be some subjective feeling or interaction in a person's heart, a cessationist heart, that involves more than just ink and paper. The words have to be made alive by an illumination, that is to say, an interactive sense in their spirit or imagination that is extra biblical. There has to be something extra biblical and subjective related to God's spirit illuminating their spirit. So it's not just pen and ink. Thus, cessationists are also adding to the word of God based on their fundamentalist cessationist construct when they say that God laid something on their heart, which is just another way of saying that God spoke to them which is anathema in their own circle. So cessationists who believe they are saved are self-refuting because they believe they have a witness in their spirit that they're one of the elect. That witness, what difference is that witness, that subjective witness that God laid some on their heart from a prophecy? I don't know. I don't think there is any difference. Thus, while their nomenclature is different, the subjective experience is not. Number nine, the ninth reason why cessationism is not true. To deny that God speaks today, spirit to spirit or heart to heart, or only through the reading of scripture, is to deny that the greatest global movement on the earth since the days of the 12 apostles has been taking place since 1906. The Azusa Street Revival, the Pentecostal movement, and has exploded, and we have more than 500 million adherents and we become the most influential sociological movement since the birth of the church 2,000 years ago. So to deny that that is of God, you must believe Satan is stronger than God because the non-charismatic churches are all dwindling and dying, and it's the Pentecostal church that's exploding. That's the number one reason why most cessationists are giving in and believing that God is still moving today and speaking because of what God's doing globally. Everybody, even Reformed people, admit the future of the church and the expansion of global Christianities with the Charismatics and Pentecostals. So if you believe that God doesn't speak, you must think that the devil is spreading the word of God more than uh, God is. Last and not least, the last reason why I don't believe cessationism is true, some might even say they would rather have the gifts of healings miracles, prophecy, and a real experience with the presence, reality, and power of God than a complete canon of Scripture. That is to say, they would rather have a few chapters missing from the book of Leviticus 
or a revelation and have the miracles then have all the information and no reality because it is it a reality of God that effectively spreads the gospel. I mean, if God gave me a choice, you could have all the gifts of the Holy Ghost. You could have everything, but I'll take it all away if I remove one Psalm or one chapter in Leviticus. I mean, there, most people in the church and the prophets and all of them didn't even have the whole canon of scripture most people don't even read the whole bible and god still could use them right there are poor people only have snippets maybe they have the gospel of john in certain muslim countries god's still moving powerfully to say that if i had all of the bible and god won't speak to me anymore is ridiculous i'd rather have a chapter missing right i cannot conceive of a god saying in heaven one day that he couldn't personally speak or move by his power anymore because the last chapter of Revelation was written, book of Revelation. Also, what about lands where the full Bible hasn't yet been translated into the language of an indigenous ethnic people? There's still languages and people haven't even heard the word, they don't even have the Bible. Does God do miracles among an illiterate tribe for 10 years? Then all of a sudden, after the Wycliffe translator finishes translating the last of the 66 books of the Bible in their native language, all the miracles suddenly cease? To espouse a view like this is laughable. Also, if Peter, James, and John, and Jesus, who is the full incarnate word of God, dependent on miracles, prophecies, and God speaking to them to spread the gospel, who are we to say that we don't need the same power to confirm God's word and promote his kingdom? Jesus is the word. And yet he still depended on miracles to spread the gospel. Peter, James, and John were the writers of scripture and knew the word personally, yet still needed the Father to speak to them personally. In conclusion, as great and comprehensive as scripture is, it contains a divine narrative regarding salvation, redemption, and the restoration of culture that cannot take the place of the Holy Spirit's specific guidance and leading. It is one thing for me to know that Jesus wants me to preach the gospel and go to the nations, but it is another thing entirely for me to know which nation to go to by a specific leading of the Lord. This can only come from a God who communicates to our spirits personally regarding his will for our lives. I end the chapter by recommending church historical books that back up what I'm saying. Um, so that's in chapter 10. Uh, Robert Gay, are you still there? You read the book. Uh, any comments on this? Well, Bishop Joe, first of all, it's good to be here once again. But um, I mean, the, the book is a tremendous book. Uh, you have uh, explained this so wonderfully and and powerfully and eloquently. Uh, you know, I was thinking as you were sharing, the, the truth of the matter is to say that the gifts have ceased uh, is in itself adding to the Bible is in itself adding to scripture. And uh, so the, again, there's a, a constant contradiction uh, with those who say that the gifts have ceased. And I'll say this also about the prophetic. I know personally, uh, we have seen uh, nothing but good come from the prophetic ministry. I know within our lives and within the church, uh, we need the prophetic. We need all the gifts of the spirit in operation. I believe that that is God's plan for the church today. It, and, um, you know, I've heard Bishop Hammond say so many times that it's really God's plan for, you know, every single gift, you know, because God distributes throughout the church the gifts as he wills. And uh, and so that there should be all of the nine gifts of the spirit operating within the church freely. There should be at least one person with uh, at least one of the nine gifts to round it out within every church. And I think whenever we begin to say no to the gifts of the spirit, we are saying no to a crucial uh, part of the equipping that we need to accomplish the purpose and the will of God. And I believe that just goes to uh, further the point that you made that the gospel is being promoted primarily by Pentecostals, Charismatics, those who embrace the gifts. And that's because the gifts of the Spirit, they it's a part of our equipment. It's a part of our armory. It's a part of what we need to be able to further the call of God, to further the gospel of the kingdom of God. And again, uh, you know, when they, when, when we see in uh, Corinthians where it says, when that which is perfect has come, 
uh, then what that which is, um, you know, in part was, is going to vanish away, you know, whether it be prophecies or cease, all the other things. But, you know, Jesus was perfection. Jesus was manifested perfection within the earth. And as you pointed out, he still operated within the gifts. He still prophesied. There were gifts of miracles, workings of healings, uh, word of knowledge. All of these things were used in his ministry. So uh, perfection in itself being manifested even in Jesus. And as you said, he was the word made flesh. Uh, he was the completed word, the, the greatest manifestation. As I would even say a greater manifestation of uh, perfection in the word than even what we have in canonized scripture. Uh, Jesus was that manifested in the flesh, but yet he still walked in miracles, functioned in all of the gifts of the spirit. So we see that um, obviously the gifts are needed. If Jesus needed them, we definitely need them. If the word made flesh needed the gifts to fulfill his ministry, how much more do we need the gifts to fulfill what God has called us to do? And again, we need to embrace uh, every one of them. And even in the midst of the, the prophetic uh, things that have happened over the last year and the controversy, the reality is we still need the prophetic. And we just have to um, be more committed than ever to embrace it, to show it, to demonstrate it in the correct way, the way that God has established for the church to function and operate within it. We want a Gmail. Amen. Wow. That you, you made such a powerful point that we're actually adding to the word of God when we say God doesn't speak because it never says that in the word, right? Right. So it's, self re, it's self refuting, right? Uh, Kyle, yeah. Bishop, Bishop Kyle, uh, you read the book. Any comment, comments on what I just shared or anything else? Yeah, um, Bishop, thank you so much. It's an outstanding book, uh, really, really outstanding. Don't just say that because you're listening. <laughs> if you weren't listening, I'd say the same thing. It's really, uh, I think, one of one of your best works, as you said earlier. Uh, really, really, really needed. And, you know, I, I was speaking to a Reformed person the other day, and his main issue with accepting the gifts of the Spirit being a reality today was the mess that can sometimes be created. Uh, as we all saw, you know, coming up to this new uh, this election we just had. There's a reason why God put despise not prophecy in the Bible. Uh, I think that, you know, certainly he knew that, that it would be somewhat messy at times, but the value of embracing a God who speaks extra scripture and speaks to individuals, rhema instead of just logos is something that I don't, I don't think we can look away from. So the book is very, very well written. Um, I pray for very, very wide distribution. The, a lot of the disillusionment that's out there can uh, can be affected by it. And I really think in a sense, it can be an instrument of revival of people really beginning to embrace. Uh, something happens, I found out in history, when there are these excesses. It seems like in the body of Christ, the pendulum swings one way or the other. You go from real legalistic holiness. God brings a holiness movement. Uh, it's powerful in the beginning. It goes into a lot more legalism. And you come out of that, the pendulum swings the other way to just deep grace. And there's this kind of swinging of the pendulum, the pendulum that happens. And I just, you know, I, I just sense coming out of what we just came from with the prophetic, that there's a sharpening, a maturing, uh, a, a real reigning in of that gift being put in certain boundaries and parameters that are going to allow just a great revival of the gifts of the spirit uh, among many mainline denominations, many uh, people who embrace the reform tradition. So I think your book's going to be an instrument in, in doing that. So I, I really, really, really appreciate the book. And I'm just grateful that you wrote it. Yeah, one of the things that makes this book so unique um, is that it has a strong ecclesiology. So uh, we show how uh, the gift of prophecy needs to have a corporate uh, unity and reality to it. Uh, so it'll encourage your people to be committed to your church and your movement, even if they're not flowing the prophetic. Uh, I would argue the book is good just to get people connected uh, instead of being independent, uh, connected to a church. I make a strong case that all the gifts of the spirit, including the APES gifts in general, are there for the edification of the body. And uh, that's what might distinguish this book from a lot of uh, contemporary books that are out there. They just focus on the gift itself, but they don't have that strong ecclesiology. Of course, I'm writing from the perspective of an apostolic uh, teacher. Uh, so uh, that's a very big concern. 
So I think this book will be the pastor's best friend or, you know, the apostle's best friend, whatever. I would encourage you to get it for everybody in your movement. But at the same time, it encourages the gift of prophecy. I give dozens of personal stories of how the gift of prophecy has impacted me. I mean, I just recently had the most profound experience I possibly ever had with a prophet where somebody uh, prophesied and told me my whole trajectory. He didn't tell me anything I didn't know. He just confirmed that what I was doing was on the right course. He didn't know my name. He just knew I was a bishop. Uh, and uh, and then he told me I'm called to write books. He says the leaders and you know people need your books, blah, blah, blah. Again, he didn't know my first name. He didn't know anything. Then to con- sort of like confirm what God was saying through him, he actually gave me the names of two of my children. He said, I see the name Jason. And, uh, and he's Spanish. He doesn't speak English, so he was a translator. Then he says, and I see the name Kendra. He said, Kendra. And the translator said, Kendra. And it was mind-blowing to me because, uh, you know, Kendra is not a common name that I know of in Latin America. And uh, 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 he just mentioned and gave a word uh, my f- oldest son, Jason, and then his wife, Kendra, both live in Seattle. So it was almost like God was using that little snippet to confirm everything else he said to me. I love the, pro- I can't imagine life without the prophetic. So this book is not going to quench the spirit. It will actually encourage it, but give the ecclesial guardrails needed uh, for prophetic uh, proficiency. Um, I think we have uh, Apostle, Bishop, Apostle, Double Apostle, Vaughn McLaughlin. Vaughn, uh, I don't think you read the book. I, I can't recall if I sent it to you. Any words, uh, anything you want to say? You're very yeah. a- a- academically astute. So anything on the topic I brought up today? Yeah, I think it's very interesting to know and to see what God is doing across uh, Reformation lines and uh, conservative fundamental lines. <laughs> of course, you know, I get a chance to teach and minister to about 75 senior pastors every week. And uh, this was so interesting. I had a, a invited a very conservative fundamental reformed uh, group of people on. And so right at the end of everything, I explained, just like you did, very didactically, scholarly, historically, I knew who I had in the audience. So I was trying to loosen them up and get them to just go with the flow and hear the Lord. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you. And so I explained some of the uh, 1 Corinthians 14, the use of the gifts and how they should uh, flow in the survey. Let it be two by the most three, let one. You know, I just kind of walked through it and I said, so now let's conclude. I want you to open yourself up. And I just want you to let the Lord download and just speak to your heart and do what you got to do. And then when it was over, the lead guy that invited everybody else in, he was like this. And I said, what's wrong? And he said, that wasn't that bad. <laughs> <laughs> he said, he said, he said, that wasn't, that wasn't that bad at all. <laughs> I, I, I can do this. I can, I can do this. And, and, and the purpose and the reason he said it was very similar to what you just did and taking the approach and laying the foundation and historically tying together those before us and those who have helped made this thing come to pass, connecting us with the church of the past, the, the middle and the present. And what happens is once you show some scholarship to sincere fundamental reform people, they really will open up and, uh, and allow you into their lives to have an impact into their lives. But we ultimately want the Holy Spirit to be able to have that impact in their lives and be the ultimate teacher. And so, um, yeah, he took them, he said, uh, he said, oh, that wasn't bad at all. I kind of <laughs> like that, you know, and I, I think I'm coming back, I, I'll be back. <laughs> and, he, and he's been back every week and it's been really good. The second thing is just real quickly, and that is, a simple law of first truth. And I think that most people are stuck where they are because it's all they know and it's what they were taught by the most influential and the most impactful people in their lives. So what happens is if grandpa or your, or your previous pastor or your bishop or your denomination or your organization taught you that from a child up, 
then that's embedded in you. That's the law of first truth. Now, everything else is against that. And now you fight against it and buck against it all your life, even though it is true. It's like truth in this. I'm going to make my case. I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to prove it. I've got experience. It's like the stage of truth. You know, I've got all of this. I've got emotions, feelings, history, tradition. I got all of this stuff. And then the person said, that's good. But I still believe what I believe. And so, and that's what truth in this is all about. And, and, and this is what we're up against in a world of subjective relativism where everybody has their own opinions and thoughts and ideas based on their culture and their relative surroundings. And so uh, that's what we need to be careful of. And lastly, our terminology. I think we scare them sometimes when we get too spooky and too mystical in our discussion with them. We're trying to get them to see what we see versus doing what you just did. And I think what your book does is laying a foundation, put it out there, and then like any seminary would be, let them then make the choice. I'm not trying to indoctrinate you, I'm trying to educate you. And when that happens and you do it with a balance in your life, that's when we win our brothers. And that's when we become the, the body of Christ. Wow. Wow, great stuff. I love that story. <laughs> it's not so bad. They probably, <laughs> they probably thought that, uh, you know, we would be crazy or wild and have no theology, right? Right. So, so that's what you do. So when you give them the theology, and we have to be careful, you know, we, we give them just, just examples, theology, history, scholarship. And once you're able to walk through the scriptures like that and give it to them, they follow. And then open them up. Had him lift those hands. You should have seen him on the screen. He was like, he he didn't know whether to turn them this way, this way. <laughs> He's like a puppy like this. He's like, lift your hands. Just didn't know what to do. Listen, oh, but I called the guy down. I called, <laughs> he had visited our church and I called him down front. Got to give me a word for him. So, you know, I called him to the front of the church and I was just going to pray for him. After, you know, lay my hands on him, do what I needed to do and speak into his life. And when he came down front, he walked all the way down that aisle. I got a 4,000 seat auditorium. He walked all the way down that aisle, stood before me, and then turned around and looked at the audience. I said, uh, excuse me, could you turn back around? I got somebody to say to you. He, he didn't know what I was about to do, had never been in that setting before. He walked, he's the pastor, 30 years. He walked down front and turns around and looks at the auditorium. Like, so what do you want me to say to them? No, I want to say something to you. And, and so those type of uh, things happen because people uh, don't have experience and people are uh, limited and, and people don't have this kind of cross-pollination and conversation. And so what I'd like to do one day is maybe invite him onto this Zoom and, let, and, and, and then I'll bring up the story and then let him explain it. And yeah. let, him, let him explain what happened there. But he, he'll, t he'll say it just like this. That wasn't that bad. I got it. Well, he's welcome any week. Uh, we're going to be unpacking certain aspects of this book for the next two weeks. Uh, and so it'll be dealing with the prophetic. So, yeah, if he's, you're more than welcome to invite anybody you know that you respect uh, at this level right. to, to get on. Yeah. You know, this guy's an urban apologetic. He's, he's a good guy. He's, he's smart as a whip. He just, He's going to smoke his cigars and sit in and, and, and oh, I'll leave that alone. <laughs> he's, he's going to his cigar bar and drink his red liquor and say, don't judge me. <laughs> tell, tell him to save a good Cuban for me. Good Cuban. Good. He's got them imported and illegal. I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that's hysterical. Uh, yep. Well, we got a few minutes uh, before we end. Any other comments, questions? Bishop? Yes. Uh, two things. One, just a little adjustment. That's actually chapter 11. Oh, okay. Well, that's the editor's fault, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> but I just thought it'd save people trouble trying to find it. Uh, yeah, chapter 11. But it's so good. And just one thought came to my mind out of something I'm sharing on uh, in my radio broadcast in Galatians. But this really goes what you're talking about really goes to the heart, I think, of what Paul was burdened for, for the church at Galatia. And he says, do I need to labor again until Christ is formed in you? 
And so just another aspect of the gifts and all that Christ has provided in the Holy Spirit, it's all part of that, that spiritual formation of Christ in us. And if you don't have that uh, flowing in your life, you don't have a fullness of the formation of Christ in you. You're working out of your own intellect or out of your own ideas. And so uh, this, uh, thank you for this gift to the body of Christ. Appreciate it. Wow, well, thank you, George. Thanks for your apostolic insight as always. Uh, a few others, uh, anybody else comment, question? Question for Bishop Vaughn or, or others uh, who are on here, that's fine too. Anybody? You have to unmute yourself first, please, because I don't know who you are if you want to speak. Uh, so unmute yourself or raise your hand and I'll unmute you. Uh, yes, Bishop. The J. Maddie thing. I, I, I just want to get back to the rebrand, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like nobody have any questions. Hey, yo, what's up, J Mac? That's all I'm, you know. Just could, could someone spell that for me? I don't even know how to spell that. J, J M A T T E, J Mac. Yo. Whoa. Got it down, man. Got it down. <laughs> okay. Well, I should I should definitely have a collective of helping me brand things because I'm not good. I'm really not good at this stuff. <laughs> Daryl, you got to help him, T. Got to help him out there, baby. Help the bishop. That's your boy. Say, Maddie, what's up? I, you got to get your cap, pull it backwards on your head. You'd be good to go. All right. All right. Wow. I think he's getting there. <laughs> I'm trying. I, I'm trying. I'm trying. Uh, that's cool. Hey, uh, Victor, can you show the link again to purchase the book? Again, it's not on my website. It's The cover is on my website, but they're not putting the link to purchase until Monday. I really should change that. But help me. I cannot promote this book. Uh, because Facebook has taken away my ability to uh, boost anything. And we were able to uh, have the same attendance as we did last year, even though I paid thousands of dollars to promote the Bridge Summit, just with you all helping me organically promote it. Um, you, you guys, we might have had more this year. We had over a thousand leaders, I believe. I don't know the final figures in the Bridge Summit, but uh, phenomenal uh, attendance. But we um, depended on you to promote it because I can't. I've been shut down on Facebook except for posting articles, but I can't boost them. Bishop, so, the link uh, is on chat. Oh, it's on the chat. Okay. So anybody who wants to copy and paste that, you could start promoting it on uh, Amazon and get a book for yourself. It's also on Kindle. You could download it. You don't need to get a printed copy. Just start reading it right away. Um, and uh, boy, I'd appreciate all of you helping get the word out. Um, okay, well, we're going to get ready to close. We thank God for all of you. It's 12 o'clock. And um, uh, Victor Nazario, can you just close in prayer for us? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful time around the table of your word. We're so grateful to you, Heavenly Father, for the wisdom that you grant us each and every day. And today we are so encouraged. Our faith has been strengthened. And uh, we thank you for this collective. Um, now we pray, Lord God, that you give us the wisdom and strategy to be able to share this with our with the people that you've given us the privilege of ministering to of discipling and father I pray your continued blessing upon everyone that's around this table right now i plead the blood of the lord jesus christ over each and every one of us of our families our children our grandchildren the ministries you've given us to steward bless each and every one lord god with um, great fruitfulness my god and throughout this summer i pray that your glory would manifest and may your light shine through each and every one, Father. We give you the praise for it. And thank you, Father, for the unity of the brethren. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. We'll love you all. Thanks for being on. Thanks for the friendship. Just take a few minutes to say goodbye to everybody.
Where can we where can well, we get uh, you, one of Vaughn's shirts? Oh, boss, <laughs> boss, that should be hey, required uh, wearing. Everybody should get one of those for the hey, team. Uh, I was in Vegas last week for nine days in the wind, twenty six hundred square foot suite, chilling, and there's a shop right across the street there, Hugo Boss, and I just bought yeah. every Boss shirt they had in their red, blue, green, yellow. <laughs> Hand them out. We all need one. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great i like that cross you got on too man that's great got it from an ethiopian descendant of the king over there lassie it's uh it's handmade individually set diamonds it was a gift by the family along with a bracelet and a ring wow and, and i didn't know what it was or how much it was worth i was in the mall one day you know they have the gold people out there i just took it off and laid it up on the thing that guy held it up he said look 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 he came over he said, I'll give you 42,000 for it. What? Yes, sir. So, so I keep it when things get really bad, when, the, when they come to take it away, I'm gonna pull it up. Listen, I went to buy a car the other day and I took it off. I said, I'll give you this for that right there. Hmm. He said, it don't work like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, you're, you're, I can't wait to spend time with you. It'll be fun. All right. All right. All right, everybody. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Take care. Thank you, Rich. Good to see you guys. Have a great day. Thank you, guys. Hey, Bye. Terrell, we got to look up, baby. We can do that. I'll connect. All right. Thank you, sir. Right. Thank you. See you. Blessings to everybody. Thanks. Hey, Brian, be cool. I'm going to sit. Hey, Brian, I'm going to inbox you. I'm a, you you're XL or you're a... Uh, oh, I'm, I'm just a, just an L. I, I'm looking up to you. <laughs> <laughs> just an L. Thank you. I'll take it. <laughs> I'm a hook. I'm your face. You on Facebook? Yeah, Brian Stockdale, Vantage I'm Washington. I'm gonna hit you. I'd love it. Thank you, sir. All right. God bless. Bye bye. Right. Take bye -bye. care, everybody.